let's get started. Welcome to the Financial Purpose Podcast. All opinions expressed by me or guests of the podcast are solely our own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Life Moves Wealth Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. Clients of Life Moves Wealth Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Financial Purpose Podcast. Thanks for joining today. This is episode 63. And I have a very special guest on the podcast today uh, who I think we're going to have, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a fun conversation. It should be good. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm already feeling like as number 63 sitting in this chair that you've said a very special guest probably 62 times before I got here. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that may or may not be true. We'll see. But anyway, uh, so on the podcast today, none other than Mr. Tom Bronson. Uh, Tom, welcome to the Financial Purpose Podcast. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, so Tom came in all the way from Dallas, Texas, just to sit in this chair and be number 63 special guest. That's it. <laughs> and, uh, and while he was in town, I figured we'd snag him and bring him on the podcast. And uh, so Tom and I are working on a project together that uh, Tom has... Um, has done a few times now, and uh, and we're bringing it to Arizona, and it's called the Business Transition Business Transitions Summit. That's why is that a tongue twister? I I don't know. I, it's easy. It rolls right off the business tongue. Transition business Summit. Transitions Summit. So BTS for yes. those who can't say it, and um, <laughs> we we uh, uh, I I went to the BTS event in Little Rock, Arkansas, in September. And, uh, and we had been in conversations prior to that. And so we've decided to bring it to Arizona. So today on the podcast, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about Tom's journey into how the transition summit became what it is and why we're bringing it to Arizona and what we kind of what the vision is for business owners, because this really will be an event for business owners. And we have people coming in from so far from other states uh, who we're looking forward to this thing. So we're really excited about it. You don't have to be only in Arizona to come, but it's just going to locality be here. So, um, so Tom, welcome to the podcast. You are a serial entrepreneur. You've owned one or two, maybe three businesses. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> you know, I hate the term serial entrepreneur because it, it, it sounds to me like somebody who buys and flips houses, right? Right. Uh, but that's not what I did. Um, I have bought and sold a hundred businesses in my career, a hundred. Yeah. And which is more than most people, but I know people who have bought and sold more than that. Um, and, but I'm not a buy, fix and flip. I was a buy and hold and at the right time, sell those businesses. In a couple of those cases, uh, they were massive roll-ups, right? And so I bought in the last company that I sold in 2018, uh, I bought 17 companies and pieced them together into one bigger company that we sold to a publicly traded company. Yeah. That was my second exit to a publicly traded company. And when I sold that last one, my team, who's been with me for a long time, various folks who have been with me through some of these acquisitions or many of them, you know, one of my partners now, gosh, we've done 65 of these uh, acquisitions and divestitures uh, together. Um, they came to me and said, are you done when you sell this one? And I said, why, why are you asking me that? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a young guy. Right. I mean, look at me, you can see me on the podcast, right? I'm not that young. Um, and, why are you asking me that? Well, because you know that we're the people who do due diligence when you're going to buy another company, and we're not doing any due diligences, so we just assume you're retiring. I said, no, I want to think about this a little differently now. In all of our transactions, we've been able to sell every one of our businesses, but I started looking at statistics, started thinking about what does the M&A ecosystem look like for the average entrepreneur? And although, let me just be clear, there is no place on the planet that you can find a repository of all the information you'd need in order to understand the whole ecosystem. So we had to go out and beg, borrow, steal, scrape, buy, 
any data we could find. And what we came up with was an algorithm that says every year about 250,000 small businesses come on the market. Now, let me define small business before I go on. Good. Small business to me is a business with under $100 million in revenue. Because that's that lower middle market and all the way down to Main Street. I think of Main Street as about 20 million and below. 20 to 100 million is that lower middle market, but that's all small business. Then you get into middle market companies. So I'm talking about small businesses. And by the way, uh, small businesses in America, there are 6.03 million businesses that employ people. There's another 22 million solopreneurs that are also businesses. Yeah. But what I'm talking about here is that market of the 6.03 million businesses that employ people, about 97% of those are less than hundred million. So small business, it's most businesses that employ people. Yeah. And a lot of those are sub 10 million. Yes. Oh, even with, more. It's with like, the two or three employees or five employees, sub 10. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when you get down, you get, you know, sub million where you have two or three employees. And and so, but all of those are lumped into that one category together. Yep. And so every year, about 250,000 of those businesses come on the market for whatever reason. Some of them want to sell. They need to sell. Somebody got sick. Maybe the owner unfortunately passed away. I've got stories about those things, getting calls from attorneys who represent the estate of a business owner that passed away and the family needs to monetize. That's a horrific outcome, but that happens more than you think. That's like half of, <laughs> I mean, some, something like ha almost half of 40, what is it? 46% of all exits are involuntary. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So imagine, if you will, 250,000 that want to, need to, have to, whatever the reason, they come on the market. But only 42,000 of them close a transaction. That translates to 83% of the businesses that want to, need to, have to sell, don't. 83%. 17% of businesses that want to, need to, have to, actually reach the closing table. And that is a horrible Not, yeah. statistic. And so we sat down and I said, okay, now that we understand that, why have we been successful 100% of the time selling every one of our businesses? Never had to close one, never had to go on the market multiple times. Why have I been successful doing this time and time again? Because we never really had given a lot of thought to that. We know how to run a business. We know, in fact, if you, to me, you take any business in America and you can pack it into a box, any business, no matter the size. When you open up that box, about that top 15% of that box, that's what you do for a living. You know, the brewery who makes beer, that's what they do for a living. The electrical contractor who installs at uh, commercial sites, that's what they do for a living. The, the pizza maker who makes pizzas, that's what he does for a living. Underneath that, 85% of that business is all sales, marketing, operations, finance, corporate governance, all those things that are, that, that are, are evident in every business, no matter what the business is. Those are the things that we always work on. Yeah. You know, the thing that you do at the top, we're not an expert at that. But the things that you do underneath, those are the things that we work on. And that's when we buy a business. Doesn't matter what the business is. I've owned high tech businesses. I've owned uh, uh, pizza restaurants. I've owned Italian restaurants. Um, the, it, uh, I've owned distribution companies. It doesn't matter what they are. All of those things are identical mm -hmm. underneath. And so when we buy a company, we get to work on those things, right? Because that, by the way, is what makes a business transitionable. And so I told my team, why can we do it and nobody else can? And so we set out to investigate what we're good at and, and what our methodology was every time we bought a business. Because surprisingly, we didn't really document all of that. We didn't say, well, we just tore it apart. You know, okay, we need to work on sales here. We need to work on operations there. We need to document these processes. But we didn't have a documented process ourselves. Yep. And that's what we came up with a a process that uh, that we use today in our consulting practice, Mastery Partners. 
we work with business owners. We have a four-step process to get their business and themselves ready for that eventual exit because that 17% of successful transitions is we want every business owner, all those 83 percenters, we want them to be in that 17% because think about it. And what you do in, in wealth management and managing people's assets, if you have a business that you can't unlock the assets, that's an illiquid asset that what good is it to you? What good is yeah. it to your family? You know, you pass away and the minute a founder whose whose business is uh, revolves around that person, we call that owner dependency, the minute that person passes away, the value of that business doesn't decline. It jumps off a cliff. Yep. And you're going to wind up in a fire sale if you can find a buyer at all. And then if that family's been dependent on the income that that business has been thrown off, well, now what, right? That's the kind of thing that, to me, should keep every business owner up at night. It should, and and that that so that scenario is um, definitely what happens in in the smaller companies. So sub ten, especially very owner dependent, high owner dependency, um, and most of them, I I can't, I would say most business owners in this, especially in the smaller businesses, they have plugged every bit of revenue net profit, right, result, <laughs> right back into the business, and they've taken a little bit out for themselves, whatever they need. Some of them have enjoyed a lifestyle, right? So they've they've started a very high-earning business, right, uh -huh. for themselves, right? And uh, I, I often joke about people who start businesses are usually the ones who are just terrible employees, and so they go make their own their own job, essentially, right? And then they don't realize that they've actually built a financial asset, and so most of them don't have a 401k or a SEP IRA or any other, you know, a deferred comp plan. They don't have anything in place. And that business is their retirement plan. But a yep. lot of them cannot unlock it. And so that 87% number or 83% number scares the shit out of me because yep. there's a lot of business owners, like you're saying, who really should be kept up at night. But they're so busy running the business and the next thing, the next thing, the next thing that you get down the end of the track and where – Hey, how do I sell my business in the next year? It's not that it's not that much different than selling a house, right? You just put right. it on the market and buyers come, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Like we have an open house exactly and people right. show up. Stick a sign in the front yard of the business and yeah. people will show up. Have an open house on a Sunday. It, yes, right? even better. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, by the way, you stumbled onto something that is uh, important that your listeners um, know about me. The reason I've had 100 businesses is because I am chronically unemployable. <laughs> You know, there's That's, there's nobody on the planet that wants me as an employee. In fact, yeah. in fact, in my last transaction, when I was selling to this publicly traded company, they had designs on me running some division for them at some point. Well, years in the past, in the in the nineties, um, I sold a company to a publicly traded company. I went to work for them for about four years, and I learned two things about myself. Number one, I'm a pretty decent CEO. I know how to call the shots. I know what shots to call. I know what levers to pull. Yeah. Number two, I'm a terrible employee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I, nobody wants me to be their employee um, because um, I'm not that smart. That's a very, Being smarter than me is a very low bar, but I don't want to work for people who are not smarter than me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when they make bad calls and bad decisions – I don't just follow like a lemming, you know, I challenge things like that. Yeah. So, so, so we set out to create this, um, process that we use four step process first, an assessment an end to end assessment of the business, uh, which includes a valuation of the business. What is this business worth? If we sold today, you know, the thing that strikes me is why don't more business owners get a valuation of their business? They have some, um, unrealistic expectation of what their business is worth. Seven times revenue. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, ironically, I just had a phone call this morning. It was a tiny little business doing about $1.2 million. And the guy said, I just, what I, I just need some, you know, what's the valuation metric here? Like I'm doing 1.2 million. Should I be charging two times that? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, 
Are you profitable? Are you taking money to the bottom line? Because a buyer is not buying your revenue. They're buying the future cash flow that that revenue will deliver. Bingo. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's more complicated than, oh, yeah, two times revenue, seven times revenue. What? No, no way. By the way, nobody buys businesses based on a multiple of revenue. One, maybe 2% of transactions ever. And those are, are, those are smaller. And I, I, I think that there's actually, um, I think business owners have a, a, a conflict on the tax side because as a business owner, you're trying to drive down your net revenue. Why? Because lower taxes. Right. The problem with driving down net revenue is it makes your business worth less. Yes. When you do evaluation. And so then we have to get into the, you know, the whole exercise of all the ad backs and all the things that are particular to that business owner that wouldn't be particular to the next business owner. But there's discounts when you do a bunch of ad backs. Right. And so it it's like, I think a lot of business owners who don't have the education on the front side are disadvantaged because they're being told one thing from their tax professional, and it's completely counter to what's going to add value to their business when they're ready to actually monetize it at right. some point, any which way that they monetize it. Absolutely. We have a term for that. It's called adjustment fatigue. Buyers get fatigued when you present them a laundry list of adjustments. Mm -hmm. Now, there are adjustment adjustments that are legitimate. So owner compensation, to the extent the owner is no longer necessary in the business. If the business is owner dependent, you have to replace that person with a salary commensurate with whatever that business owner does. Right. So let's say the business owner's taking a half a million dollars out of the business annually, but we could hire somebody for $125,000 to do the job. So you take, you add back the 500,000, but then you decrease by 125 plus taxes, you know, fully loaded because right. it's going to take that to now. So the, yeah. so the Benefits. beauty is, and I say this all the time, a business that is no longer owner dependent suddenly becomes worth a lot more than a business that has any owner dependency issues. Because why? It, let's say that you you're fortunate enough to be in an industry that sells at three to six times earnings. So that adjusted add back the the earnings that you that you deliver, and they make six times earnings. And if it no longer needs the owner, if the owner could drop off the face of the earth and the business would continue to operate, that's what I mean as a business that no longer has any owner dependency. Well, that piece of the salary, you don't have to add that back and you get six times, if you're getting six times earnings, you get six times that $125,000, you got another $700,000, $800,000 sure. in the value of that business. And so, so you know, a lot of times business owners like to be the big cheese, the person, you know, the go-to, answer all the questions. Man, take a vacation. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> well, and that's, but that's a challenging proposition for a lot because we, we've shifted to such a high service economy that, I mean, if you think of people like um, primary care physicians and dentists and financial planners and consultants and insurance agents and – Anybody who is really like doing a thing, oftentimes that owner is very, very good at the craft, which is why they start the business. And that becomes very difficult to translate. So, I mean, I how many businesses are a primary care physician with a physician's assistant and a front desk and a nurse, right? And maybe, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, a phlebotomist or something. So you have a four or five member team, but without that physician, there is no revenue. Right. And that happens with dentists and yep. and that happens with people like me all the time. And so it's a very difficult proposition to be able to replace yourself in such a way. I mean, the business owner has to be fully intentional about it, it's not that they need to um it's not that they need to be able to give themselves more vacation time, but it's like if you're in any business and you're climbing the corporate ladder, you cannot get promoted until you have replaced yourself. Right. And you've passed on that tribal knowledge and you've made yourself invaluable in that seat, which makes you more valuable for the next one. Mm -hmm. And I think as business owners, when we are terrible employees and so we start our own thing, we forget that maxim, which has been true yep. for eons. Well, you know, that's when we started this whole process of developing mastery partners. I needed intellectual property around this because the problem is in my head are all these things that we needed to do. Mm -hmm. 
how do we get that stuff out of my head and translate it to working documents and processes? And so, you know, over the last several years, our team has worked very diligently to extract all of that tribal knowledge that I have, but also the knowledge that each one of our team members have had so that we can train other people how to do this. And so I'm no longer needed when it comes to working with a client who needs to get their business ready. I've got other people who can do that. And so it, you translate that to that, that uh, physician or to that dentist or, or the solopreneur uh, who starts his company and he's really the technologist, if you will, mm -hmm. who knows the craft. How do you teach other people how to do that? Now, in the medical profession, you've got unique challenges because, you know, you kind of want your doctor to be a licensed professional. You it's know, helpful. And stuff it's like definitely that. Well, helpful. Yeah. I don't know. I would argue uh, there are many <laughs> times that I feel like that there should be some line that I should be able to self-prescribe up to <laughs> Yeah. Uh, because I've run into some doctors that I perceive are not as smart as me. And again... Not a very high bar, you know. That I and said. I, th I think that's true in in most industries. I mean, you and I had a, a conversation over lunch about my industry, mm -hmm. and so yeah, no, the bar's low, and those who can happily climb it yeah. and step over it, um, yeah. you know, are, they they set themselves apart pretty quickly. But well, yeah. so let me let me get back to our process. We've got that assessment, yep, and then the the valuation. By the way, when we deliver that valuation. If you're watching this podcast, then here's what you get. You open it up and then you go, if you can't see me, if you're just listening, you just saw my shoulders slump and the business owner goes, oh. Sink into the chair. And Moment yeah, of truth. They're you know, melting into the chair. Yeah. And almost always I ask, what's the matter? It's, well, I was kind of hoping that it was worth three times that or five times that. One time I heard 12 times that. And I said, did you think it was worth that? Well, yeah. Why? Well, because I've, I've poured my soul into this. I, I've worked for 20 years on this. Hey, by the way, nobody cares. The buyer, this is not their baby. Mm -hmm. They are buying future cash flow delivered by the revenue of this business. If you can deliver predictable future cash flow, that's what a buyer is buying. They don't care that you spent 25 years working Saturdays and Sundays right. and all that. I mean, great. That's who you were, but that does not translate into why a buyer is buying. So you've got to look at it from the eyes of a buyer. So we then get into those conversations. Well, what do you need it to be worth? Well, I kind of need it to be worth, you know, if I told them it's worth $2 million, I kind of need it to be worth $5 million. Okay, kind of need it to be worth. What does that mean? Well, I, I just, I'd like it to be worth $5 million. Why $5 million? And if you, if you ask them enough questions... They always come up with the same answer. That's what I need to retire on. Okay, two things about that. Number one, I have yet to find an altruistic buyer who will just pay you whatever you need to retire on for your <laughs> business. Right. Because if I ever find one of those, I got lots of businesses to sell to them. But number two, do you have a financial advisor who's telling you that's how much you need to retire on? Or are you guessing just like you were guessing at the value of this business. Nine times out of 10, well, I don't have a financial advisor. Why not? Well, because 90% of my net worth is tied up in this business. I get that. Um, and you are the same as 95% of business owners. Yeah. All of your net worth is tied up in this business. I totally get that. Until we can unlock that, though, we got a problem. But here's why you need a financial advisor. That's the person who can tell you, based on your lifestyle, based on your outcomes, based on the things that you desire out of your life, how much you need to live on for the rest of your life. That's the only way you can get a number. You can't pull it out of your head. I had one guy one time that said, well, you know, I used to be a CFO, so I'm pretty good with numbers. I said, so it's $5 million? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, is that pre-tax or post-tax? 
And he said, huh, maybe I need a financial advisor. Yes, maybe you do. Maybe. Right? There's my commercial for you, by the way. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, yes, thank you. But the again, there. this is another place where business owners are challenged because they need financial advice long before they're ready, but but many in my industry are not ready to talk to them until right. there's money that they can manage and charge a fee on. Which to me is so short-sighted because – Eventually, we're going to get to a liquidity event here, people. And right? it's too late in the process yeah. because they need advice long before about – because the way I look at it is that if if you are – if you tell me that you are thinking about exiting a business in five or ten or two or three years, whatever the time frame is, why don't we have time to work a plan? And so by the time that the actual transaction happens, all we then do is convert it to the next leg of the plan. We're just working a plan that's already in place. We're yeah. not – Suddenly having, you know, this sudden money effect where now we have all this money and now, oh, we've got to invest it and do all these things. We already have a plan for that in place. And then we just execute once the money's there. And yeah, the, it's, just, it's a the different worst time to call you is the day after an event. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I just, hey, I just, uh, I just had $10 million show up in my bank account. Uh, how do I minimize my taxes? <laughs> um, well, that should have happened about a year ago. But, right. You know, that's and this is why we talk to business owners about you need to be thinking about this stuff in advance. You and I talked at lunch today about, um, you know, a business owner that really is planning on selling his business in five years. And he's a C Corp. By the way, if your business was set up after 1996, I think it was, the the LLC uh, was created. Mm -hmm. was it, I think it was around 96, 97, somewhere in that time frame. If you started your business after that date and you're a C-Corp, then uh, I think your CPA and your attorney should be brought in for malpractice. <laughs> Uh, for now, a lot of businesses, yeah, that's true. Yeah, for yeah. a lot of businesses. Yeah. Not all businesses, yeah. I get it. But but that's my long-running joke. It's my joke, and I'm standing behind it. Dale. Do it. So, so, but, it's a safe space yeah, here, Tom. But, safe space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel so threatened. Uh, so, the, um, so this guy is a C-Corp, and he's been around for 41 years. He inherited the business from his grandfather, and, uh, and it's a C-Corp. And I said, okay, well, you want to transition in about five years? We need, to, we need to have a conversation with your CPA now about should we convert to a pass-through so that you won't be double taxed? And by the way, if you don't understand any of that, that's a that's a whole conversation for another podcast, and you've probably done one on that. But uh, but you should you have to plan. And by the way, if you call me a year before you want to transition and you want to and you want to minimize your taxes, well, one of the tools that you can do is convert to a pass-through corp or pass-through entity, an S-corp or an LLC or partnership that is a pass-through. So you're not paying two times the taxes on this. Tax is a corporate event and tax is a personal event. Then, um, But if you do that within five years of a transaction, if you make that conversion, there's a five-year look back, and yep. it, which means – Oh, well, the federal government goes, oh, well, you just converted from a C-Corp to an S-Corp last year to avoid paying taxes, and therefore, you're going to pay those taxes. And so so that's why it, you have to start thinking about this stuff five years in advance. It's all, a, it's all, it's all an executable plan, and that's, that's the challenge is you have to have the, the runway to be able to execute a plan. Yeah. Yep, that's it. And so, but that's the thing. What's the plan look like? What do I need to do? So, so we finish this step one, which is the assessment and valuation. Mm -hmm. And then we sit with the business owner and we go, okay, I've got a very clear, accurate picture of what your business looks like today. I understand where the lumps are. I understand where, where you're really doing things really well. Uh, and, um, but talk to me about what that exit looks like, because if you can paint me as clear a picture of the end game as I have of your starting point, which is today, then we can build a roadmap to get you there. Yeah. The things that you need to do in order to make that business worth two or three times what it's worth today. The things we need to do to minimize the tax consequences. The things we need to do in order to, let's say you want to do an ESOP or you want to do a, a managed a buyout, you know, a leveraged buyout from your management group, let them buy your business out. Those things take time to plan for. Those things take time 
to work through what is the strategy, how do we get there? And so we've now we've come up with this roadmap to get you where you want to be into that circle that you've now defined as this is what my ideal outcome looks like. Now you've got a plan so you can go execute that plan rather than walking in every day and getting caught stirring the sauce. You, are you familiar with that term? Yep. Business, you know, when I when I owned a restaurant, I had two choices every day when I walked in the door. I could work on my business or I can go stir the sauce, right, <laughs> make the sauce. Well, um, as a business owner, we want you to start thinking strategically and thinking about how do I make my business worth more? How do I, how do I get my business ready for transition? How do I get? And so this strategy gives you a, a way to do that. Step three is just the execution of that strategy. You can go do it yourself. You can do it with us. Uh, however, uh, and then step four, we've reached the promised land. The business is worth what I wanted it to be worth. Um, the things that needed to be done are done. We've documented all the processes. We, everything's clean. But you know what I hear more than anything else at the end of step three? Step four, by the way, is you're ready for transition. Now what? Mm -hmm. And more times than not, I hear when we go through that execution phase and get the business ready, business owners look at me and go, eh, meh, 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 meh. let's tap the brakes here a little bit. Why? Well, because I'm having more fun. I'm making more money. You know, I just got back from a three-week Alaskan cruise that I didn't call the office at all. And the place seems to hum along without me. Maybe I can hold on to this for a little bit longer. <laughs> Great. That is a fantastic outcome as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You're no longer a slave to your business. Your business is now serving you, not you serving it. And it's just a glorious outcome. And by the way, now you can harvest some of that profits and, and invest that so that you can divest yourself of having 95% of your net worth tied up in one asset. Now maybe you can have other assets that you can... Uh, invest in. I love that. Those are glorious outcomes. But for those that are ready to sell, then we have North Star Mergers and Acquisitions to help our clients actually take them onto the market and go. And so uh, now we've got those businesses, the consulting practice that gets businesses ready for transition. We've got a uh, M&A investment banking firm that will take businesses to market. But I'm passionate about educating business owners. Yeah. Now, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm pouring into your listeners now talking about the things that we should be thinking about. Well, how do we go one to many on that, right? How do, we, how do we get that message out? I'm very passionate about teaching business owners the things that they need to know. Whether they become a client of ours or not is immaterial. I want to change the outcome of that 83% of businesses that can't transition and that's why we came up with the strategy of these business transition summits, which we are bringing now to Arizona. This will be our fourth summit. We did, we've done two in, um, in Texas. We did one in Little Rock that you came to. Yep. And now we're bringing one to Arizona. And, and a business transition summit. I know, Tom, I don't, but I don't want to sell my business for you know, 15 years. I'm not looking to sell my business today. Right. Well, there are things you need to be doing today, even if you want to sell your business in 15 years, that will make it more valuable and more transferable. Yep. And that's what this Business Transition Summit is all about. You have assembled an amazing group of advisors who are going to be working with us on bringing together this summit here in Arizona, uh, uh, currently targeted for March 4th. Yep. Right. March 4th, 2025, yeah. Yeah, March 4th, 25. Yeah. So in case you listen to this podcast on March 5th, too late. Sorry, you missed it. <laughs> we'll do it again. Yeah, right. There you go. Yeah. Uh, next year. But um, you're, you're right. By the way, we had a – the reason you came into town, we had uh, – we assembled the board last night, had a dinner, and, I mean, uh, I think very highly of every person that's on that board, and I'm very fortunate that they're they're joining the mission and, and we're going forward. That's going to add a lot of value. Yeah. To the so, event. so that was my, my vision was how do I get business owners in a, in a room and, and really 
meet them where they are, somewhere along the way on the business ownership journey. And we could spend a whole podcast talking about the ownership journey. You've seen my my visuals on that. Yep. You know, every business goes through a life cycle from the first idea that I want to start a business to I'm now a thriving uh, member of society, have sold my business, and and here's where I want to contribute to society. And and uh, the eight, the seven steps in between that. So there's nine steps uh, total. But uh, so at the event, uh, no matter where the business owner is in that journey, then we want to provide educational opportunities for that business owner to learn about the things that they can do in their business right now, tomorrow, when you go back to your business. How do I take action to change the outcome so that I can wind up being in the 17% club? You know, the folks that actually do put their business on the market and reach that ideal exit that they're looking for, as opposed to being that 83%. By the way, that 83% doesn't mean you're in the 83% forever. What that means is for a small business, the average business has to come on the market five or six times before they actually sell the business. Yeah. And, and by the way, that doesn't mean stick a sign in the yard and 30 days later, we take the sign down and then we come on 30 days later, stick the sign in the yard. When you're in a process to sell the business, it is nine to 18 months. Yeah. And for business owners that are ready to sell and have to go through a nine to 18 month process five or six times, do the math, you're still in this business for another 10 years. Yeah. That's horrible. Uh, so come and learn at the Business Transition Summit about the things that you can do to make your business more valuable, the things that you can do to reduce the taxes, ultimately put more money in your pocket. I mean, you were just telling me about something at lunch that I'm stupefied at. We can't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know that we want to get into the details of that, yeah. but... Yeah. Wow. I mean, the, there's some there's some exciting things that you can do uh, to retain more of that money. Right. And, yeah. and these these aren't earth shattering things. They're just they're just basic things that drive value in your business. And, and some of it's personnel related. Some of it's financial related. Some of it's going to be operations. A lot of it mm-hmm. is operations. Geez, a lot of it is operations related, um, which spill into all those other things. And so. These are things that, as a business owner, if you can if you can master these things, that's how you become less owner dependent as a business. And the beautiful thing about that is you then are you're you're becoming more of a leader, more of an investor in your business, and less yeah. of an operator. And now you're building leadership teams. And when you build leadership teams, you're you're creating a culture that's sticky. Yeah. And so that makes your business worth significantly more if you have a management team that's going to stay in place. A sales team that's going to stay in place, a marketing team, mm-hmm. all the you know, all of these things aren't going to crumble when somebody else comes in to take over the business. I mean, it's just it's it's all massive stuff, but it all, all of this stuff takes a couple of years to implement and to grow yeah. and to grow. And so that's why that's why I said earlier, you need a runway and you need to be very intentional about what you're doing on every step of that runway. Yeah, we always say three to five years. It takes three to five years. If you're a C corp. It's going to take at least five years. To get right, business because of the look back, yeah. Likely. Uh, there there are reasons to have a C-Corp, very few, uh, but, uh, but some that you want to retain that way. But, I mean, if you really need to retain your earnings for investments and things like that, C-Corp is probably not a terrible uh, choice for you. But very few sure. companies well, need and, to retain Well, and certainly if earning. you're planning on going public, right. that makes sense. But, yeah. Exactly. So, so um, but, uh, but it takes three to five years to get your business ready. Now, I do have a client. When we first started our process uh, and I started posting social media about, here's, here's what we're doing. We put together this process. I had an old friend that I hadn't talked to for 20 years. He called me. He says, man, you don't know this about me now, but I started this business, you know, 10 years ago. We're going to do this, and, and I probably need your services. I said, really? Tell me about your business. He described it to me. I said, so what's your exit plan? He goes, I want to sell this business in 15 years when I turn 70, when I turn 70, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to, I'm going to hang it up. And I said, well, call me in 10 years. He goes, no. I said, if you can help me make my business more valuable in those last three to five years, imagine if we work together for 15 years, what my business is going to be worth. 
I went, oh, okay, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a smart play, right? Mm. And so, yeah. so we're working with him. I mean, he's multiplied. We're now five years into this. He's multiplied the value of his business. And by the way, it's no longer about the money for him now, right? Because he makes lots of money mm-hmm. in his business. Now it's just now it's the fun of the game. And he thinks that, okay, when I hit 70, he actually recently said, maybe 75. <laughs> okay. I, I was going to say, as soon as he said 70, I'm done. I'm like, sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. It's, it's an addiction, man. Business, like, especially when it's your baby and you, yep. you've, you know, raised it. It's an addiction. Oh, I know. I know. But by the way, you know, just like uh, my good friend Justin Goodbread's book says, your baby's ugly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're the only one who thinks that it's a beautiful baby. Um, but if you can make that baby beautiful by making it more attractive, by making it more valuable, mm-hmm. then other people will love your baby as well. Now, yeah. but, you know, the other thing is, too, I, I don't know that we'd necessarily want to go too far down this path, but a lot of business owners, envision themselves as the next owner. I see somebody like me. Oh, sure. This is, I see somebody who's, they're going to take my baby and they're going to swaddle that baby and they're going to, they're going to take care. No, don't, don't view it like that because nobody who's going to buy your business is going to treat it the same with the same passion that you did. They can't. Yeah, they, they can't. A second generation business owner can never approach it the same way that the first generation. There, it's it's such a disconnect. Yes, because for this, the second generation, this is a financial, yes, transaction. Yeah, and it's a it's an investment that I'm going to make, that someday I'll get a return on. And for the first generation, I started this blood, sweat, and tears. I went through 2008. I I had the tax liens. I had the I yep. right all the all the war stories. Right, yep. and here I am. And so you should treat it with the same gravity and and it's just it's not possible no it's not and so so don't envision that the future owner of your business is you yeah don't you're not going to find the future owner by looking in the mirror you're going to find somebody who wants to get a return on investment who's going to think about the business differently than you did and by the way you know i i always hate that term and i when i say your baby's ugly but don't treat your business like your baby it's not your baby if you had children those are your children Mm mm-hmm this is an asset. This is a, a tangible thing that can be sold later and, and bring you monetary value, just like your house. Yep. And just like your house, if you want to sell your house six months in advance, man, you're going to start doing all kinds of things. You're going to do the spring cleaning. You're going to invite your friend in who's a realtor who's going to tell you, get rid of all this crap, you know, do the, you know. and Paint this. Paint this. Put the new carpet. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah. still got the Corian countertops, I yeah. see. Yeah. Light pink. That yeah. was lovely in the 90s, yeah. right? And, and you're going to go fix those things up. Why wouldn't you do that for your most important asset, which is your business? Why wouldn't you think about those things in advance and yeah. get somebody to look at it who's going to go, oh, okay, this is why I need to do those things. So I know a realtor uh, here in town who uh, this time of year, especially when she's showing a house, um, she f- has a scent of pumpkin spice that goes through the house. <laughs> so when you walk in, right? And so like I remember when Melissa and I sold our house in Michigan, Melissa, every time we would have a showing, we only, by the grace of God, only had a couple. Um but she would bake something mm-hmm. and leave it on the counter, you know, cookies yeah. or whatever. And so the house would just smell yeah. nice and inviting, whatever. So I yeah, can't. It doesn't like, sell like my, it smell like my dirty cat box. Exactly. Or, or my <laughs> socks or whatever. So I'm like, man, there's got to be, I got to come up with a really good analogy about like putting the pumpkin spice aroma in your business, you know, to get it ready. But I don't know. I think it's probably pretty cheesy. Well, well you know, and this, you might find this funny. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. You know, Cinnabon. Yeah. You know, you walk by a Cinnabon in the mall. Oh, you can you know, smell it wherever. across the mall. But did you know that that's not coming from the ovens? No. There's a company in Charlotte. <laughs> no. Oh, that, this is terrible. <laughs> there's a company in Charlotte that manufactures that scent, and it is, they're blowing it into the mall. It doesn't come from the ovens. 
I mean, there's certainly some sure. scent that comes from the oven. But if you ever walk by a Cinnabon, man, you can smell it five stores down. You can. And and by the way, it's like this magnet. Oh, must have Cinnabon. It's, yeah, I was right? thinking of like, so. is it like the old Scooby Doo <laughs> where like they get caught in the waft and they're just like floating in exactly. the Exactly. That's exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's just like I don't I don't even eat these things, and I'm like I want one so bad right yeah. now. <laughs> so let me apologize, anybody who works for Cinnabon. I just gave away your secret. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but that's. That's exactly what they do. Yeah, and so because those insane. scents smell, yeah, man, can we put the new car smell in the business? That we, I think we've stumbled onto something here. We might need to go find a brewery after this and we explore might, that. We <laughs> might. We might. So um, so I know we're, we're kind of coming up on time. and um, Really? Uh, Good Lord. Didn't we just start? We could do this for another day probably. But um, I, I just to kind of bring it back to the transition summit that we're bringing here in Arizona. So we're working at this point. If you're listening, we're working on location and we're working on ticket prices and all the operations things. But really, what what we want to do with it, um, and what what I've seen you do with it in the other locations is, it's a it's a day of really great education for business owners. I know when I went to Little Rock, I was like half a participant. Because I, I paid to be there. Right. So half a participant, half an observer, because I knew we were going to bring this into Arizona. I you double. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you were half and half. Yeah, I hope I you, you might. You might <laughs> we might want to revisit that. So um, I, I, there's an IOU coming for the Arizona oh, one. Man. I'm telling you. Golly. So, yeah. Anyway, um, so I went and uh, what I did is I, I kind of picked, especially in the breakouts, like where I thought. I needed to sharpen my saw a little bit for my my business owner clients. So what do I need to what would be helpful for me to go learn mm. or hear again that would be helpful to them? And the trouble that I ran into is that there were a couple of sessions where I was like, I don't know which one to pick. I mm. I, I want to do both. So clone Dale, go to both, right? Yeah. Um but you walk away with uh with really tangible Next steps, and I remember something that you said in one of the break or one of the main sessions was the trouble with a lot of conferences like that is you have all these great ideas and you're going to go attack them first thing Monday morning because you're fresh off the conference and you're you know rah mm -hmm. ready to rock and then three. And by the way, your team's going to be rolling their eyes. You know, oh, he went to oh, he got conference. another thing. Yeah, yeah. And and so you're going to have to now be you're going to have to try to speak a language that they haven't heard before, and so. And then three years later, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that was actually, uh, yeah. And then you're going to throw the <laughs> notes away. And so what we want to do, and this is what you said, you're like, you're going to have a list of things. Pick one mm -hmm. and attack that one, right? And that, to me, that's like um, if you read uh, if you read Traction, mm. right, the book Traction, yep. um, Gino Wickman, it, yep. that's exactly the point is like you you have a list of of things that you need to attack in your business, never do them in order that you write mm -hmm. them down. Pick the first one, the one that's most important, and attack it. Yep. And attack it until it's solved, and then go to the second one. And we want to give business owners an opportunity to to learn. This is not a selling event. No. So nobody's going to be on stage offering you their 990, 995 program, yeah. and it's it's 994 if you sign up in the next five right. minutes, right? Yeah. Like, none right. of that BS. No. It really is come get educated there's going to be some, we're going to work on some things for jumping off points and what's next and all of that. But the, the key is it's a day that you take out of your business to invest in yourself. It's putting on your own oxygen mask so then you can go back in and help other people wear theirs. Yeah. And that's kind of the way that I look at it. So yeah, I, I couldn't describe it any better than that. I mean, it's, you do, you go to an event and you learn 20 things and well, what are you going to do with it? You're going to put them on a list and check them off. No. You're going to do one, two, maybe three things tops. Well, pick those things that you're going to do and then go take action and change your own outcome, right? Yeah. One of, one of my favorite writers, he's very irreverent in many things that he does, Jeff Gittimer. Do you know, <laughs> yeah. you know Gittimer? Little Red Book of Sales. Actually, yeah. Ah. So Gittimer is a, a friend of mine. We kind of started down the same path in Charlotte. He got more famous than I did. Um, which I love him for. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in the Little Red Book of Sales, uh, I think it's chapter, like the last chapter, 13 or it's 12 things and 12 and a half or whatever. But it's, it, you know, um, if you already know what you're doing wrong, 
why don't you kick your own ass? <laughs> yeah. You know, why are you waiting for somebody else to kick yes. your ass to go do these things? Yeah. So when you learn it, if you know that and you go, oh man, you know, by the way, anybody who comes to this event and I, and I hope everybody who's uh, paying attention to this podcast now does, because there's going to be gold in it that you can bring back and, and sure. change the outcome for your business. But if you, if you just do the one thing, right. If you know what you're doing wrong and you discover, oh man, you come to this event, you're not going to learn a million things you've never heard before, but what it's going to be is a reminder of the things that you should be. Oh man, I knew that. Why am mm -hmm. I not doing that? Mm -hmm. And go back and do those things. It will change the outcome for the business. And I just, I am, I love watching business owners transform their lives by learning things at these events and going back and making a difference in their business. There was a guy in Little Rock. I, I meant to ask you about this. Um, in the middle of your afternoon session, who raised his hand and, and he said, he was sitting in the front, the front table. And he said, I've been running my business for 27 years. I, I don't know any of this stuff. Like mm -hmm. I've just been doing it and you're telling me I'm doing it wrong. You had a separate conversation with that gentleman oh, after yeah. your, what, what did you say to him? What, I, he, he said, you know, I, I've never really thought about this stuff. Well, so now it's time to go take action. You, you know, it's just like this client I was with two days ago before I jumped on an airplane and come over, came over to, uh, to Scottsdale. Um, he's like, man, I'm just not that smart. I'm just not that smart. You know, I know how to do this and I know how to do that. And this is all I know how to do. Right. You've survived in your business for 41 years. Right. Your business has thrown off a, a great sum of money, you know, to you. It's a great and valuable asset. Don't, don't sell yourself short. You know a lot of stuff. It's just that you've been focused on being that technologist that we talked back, talked about before. Mm -hmm. The guy who makes the sauce. The guy who, who stirs the the sauce. Who who makes the pancakes. Who you know who. Uh, it's the cobbler whose uh, whose children don't have any shoes. Right. You're you're a great business person, and you know you know how to do what you're doing. But take these things that you've learned here and go back and change the outcome. Teach somebody else how to do some of those things that are tying you there. If I hear a business owner tell me, I have to be in my, I've got to be in the business or this won't happen. Okay, well, then why don't you teach somebody else how to do this right. or that or right. whatever, right? And so, so yeah, in, in that case, we had a great conversation because he just... I mean, he interrupted me right in the middle of my uh, of my talk. He's like, <laughs> he did. I don't know any of this stuff. Right? And I'm like, well, you came to the right place. Sir. Yes, yeah, right. And so uh, he'll be he'll he'll. We've had conversations since. He'll be a great good. friend and a, and a good client. And uh, and it's look, it's not rocket science. It really isn't. You know, you start a business and you're really good at doing something and and. Getting that business ready for transition, it's almost a paint by numbers, but you got to know what colors go on what numbers, right? Right. And so, and that's what we are all about teaching business owners is how to do that. And we deliver it in an, in it, what I like to say is my vision is I want it to feel like a first class ride, right? Like you're, you're going to Europe in first class, uh, you get great food. You, you get great education, you feel refreshed at the end of the day, and then we have a happy hour. And by the way, lots of time in between sessions to interact with the people who are delivering the content and to interact with other business owners because the stuff that I love are when business owners interact and they learn from each other, Absolutely. Right? the different things to do. Yeah. And so it's just a great day. You work in your business every day. Come work on your business. Take one day. Invest in yourself, invest in your future, invest in your business. Take one day and come. I promise you the outcome will be amazing. And for the business owner that, because um, I, I was talking to one of my clients about it, and I said, look, I absolutely want you to be there because he is planning an exit. We've been talking about it for a year. And so he was like, oh, I, I can't. I can't take a day out of the office. And I said, the, the, the reason that you can't take a day out of the office is exactly why you need to take a day out of the office exactly. and come to this thing. Exactly. And so if you're a business owner, you're like, oh, I, can't, I couldn't even, I can't, I can't, the emails and the, then you need to be there. You absolutely, mm -hmm. this is going to help you get out of that 
death cycle of yeah. Yeah. of the owner dependency thing. So yeah, look, if you take a day out of your office, nobody dies, nobody get cancer. You know, you, you, it'll still the be there when you catch get fire. Back. Yeah, the building is a catch stuff. fire. Yeah. You know, and it's it's okay. Go take time, step back, because the only way to get better is to take a moment, breathe. Look at other business owners, talk with other folks, learn from incredibly knowledgeable people. And I have to tell you, you've assembled an amazing board here. They're awesome. These people are going to deliver a first class education uh, to the people that come. And by the way, there's multiple choices, right? You come and you're going to hear a couple of keynote speakers together, maybe at the lunch or the breakfast. But then you've got choices, breakout sessions where you can choose, and that's what you're talking about. Where yeah. I'm torn between this and that. Well, don't. Well, bring your friend. You know, <laughs> bring your business associate and go to all. Of go to all. Them, right. That's and, a great idea. And and learn from all of them. But but don't come and get overwhelmed with a hundred things I need to do. Pick one or two or three things and go execute on those. Yep. Change the trajectory. So we're planning on opening um, the. Uh, registrations around December 1st. That's kind of our yes, target sir. at this point. And so we're at businesstransitionssummit.com. Yes, businesstransitionssummit.com. Dot com. So, and you'll be able to click on the Arizona link, and then you can learn more about the sessions that we'll have. You'll learn more about, uh, you know, the event, the location. We're nailing all that down yep. now. I brought, you know, our event manager was out with me uh, the last couple of days, and she's scouting events. Lots of fun places to go here. Absolutely. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're in California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, New York, wherever you are. Or Mauritius. Sure. <laughs> it's March. I actually have a client in Mauritius. It's March in, where is that even? Uh, I'll say, do you know where Madagascar is? Yes. Right off the coast of West Africa. Uh -huh. Go about 1,700 kilometers into the middle of the Indian Ocean. There's Mauritius. Okay. And by the way, foodie capital of the world. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm a red-blooded American. I don't know how to convert <laughs> kilometers to miles or whatever. So yeah, well, that's why I say kilometers because no, nobody can ever, nobody in America can second guess. Me no, no, that, no, right? not 1, at all. Seventeen hundred kilometers. Do the math. Yeah, know? one goes into one one time. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. So, um, so no, that that should be a lot of fun. And so we're working on location, or whatever. But wherever you're coming in from, um, it's March in Scottsdale. <laughs> right. I mean, the <laughs> come to the business transition summit and then go to spring training and then go to spring training or come for spring training and take a day off and come to us. And so uh, more to come on that. Definitely hit my LinkedIn page. Uh, connect with Tom on LinkedIn. Yep. Um, connect with the business transition summit LinkedIn page. We'll have all the content there. But um, Tom, any any parting thoughts? Anybody? Anything? No, just uh, if you want to find me, it's very easy. Mastery Partners. Master with a Y. Masterypartners.com. Uh, there's a link to schedule a phone call with me. It yeah. doesn't cost you anything. You can go to northstar-mergers.com and, of course, businesstransitionsummit.com. These are all great places that have lots and lots of free content available for you on the website to just start learning and, and go buy any of my books, right? I've written three books on this yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, that's so right. Just look me up, Tom Bronson, on Amazon you'll find more than you care to. Yep. And uh, you can also send an email to info at lifemoveswealth.com and just say Tom's books and I will get them in the mail to you. Just give me your address and where you are and, and we'll make sure you get them. So um, there are three of them. I've read two. There's uh, one of them that I have not read yet. And that's so, Efficiency Amplified. That that's is the one. The most recent. So one of the one of the big, big mistakes that business owners make is they don't document the processes in their business. Sure. And and I co-authored this book with a great friend of mine, Susan Fenema, who is a business process guru. I mean, she, uh, she invented business processes. She's amazing. And in that book, we collaborate. She's the smart one. I'm just tagging along for the ride. Uh, and it is all about how to develop processes. So, so if you want to step-by-step how to develop processes in your business, Efficiency Amplified, you can get it on Amazon. You can get the other two, uh, uh, Maximize Business Value and the Maximize Business Value Playbook. Uh, those are both available on Audible as well. Yeah. And the, the playbook, by the way, 65 things that you can do in your business to add value. It's it's great. I, I just finished it within the last couple of weeks and there were things that I tabbed and flagged and whatever for clients. It's it's fantastic. So definitely check that out. Um, so, again, we'll put uh, the connections, uh, the links to Tom in the show notes. 
and uh, make sure that that's in there. And then you can always email info at lifemoveswealth.com and we'll get you all the information. Uh, and then stay tuned for the Business Transition Summit in Arizona. It's going to be fantastic and hope you can make it. So um, I'll be there. I'll be there. Hey, well, we got two it's so far. It's going to be a great time. <laughs> so uh, that's it for now. And so, Tom, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm glad that you were in town and we could make this happen. And really thank you, Josh, it. for squeezing us in so that's right the man behind the curtain the man yeah the wizard of oz back there he's turning all the dials and exactly. doing all the things so got the fire in the back i know it's he's he's great <laughs> so uh so thank you for listening um until next time go be financially awesome take care see ya thanks for listening to this episode be sure to like subscribe and share to learn more about your financial purpose visit lifemoveswealth.com 